Thank you. Go on. Thanks very much. Thank you. So we'll talk about the three must-haves. And what are they? What are the three things everyone must have? The three must-haves. What did we say they were? Skill, ability, and knowledge. And we were on knowledge last week, right? We were on knowledge last week. OK. OK. Yeah, are you ready? Find knowledge. All right. We were on knowledge last week. And let me go on to some of the things we began to discuss last week for us. We said knowledge, the meaning of knowledge was theoretical understanding of a subject, acquaintance with facts, truth, and principles, or mental comprehension. That should be in your notes by now. Then we said to ourselves, how do we develop this knowledge? It's developed by confidence, by having desire, willingness to learn, to read daily. What else did we say? The discipline to study. If you're not disciplined to study, it's going to be really hard to gain knowledge in your field or profession. It's going to be really difficult. We also said we needed to uh, uh, share knowledge because that helps us. So we say Ezra 7, how Ezra began to do what? He engaged in, in three things. Oh, well, this is he engaged in three things. Ezra engaged in three things. I'm sorry? But, but so, Ezra engaged in three things. In the study, some people change their names, so let's, let's, help, let's agree with it. It's teaching and what? Study, practice, and what? And teaching. And teaching, thank you. All right, the work. Also, we need to find new sources of learning, new ways of doing things, new ways of, of learning. Some of us might learn by audio, some of us might learn by, by video, some of us learn, but just learn any which way. You've got to be growing in your knowledge. Extremely important for us to do that. If we're not growing knowledge in a few years' time, we won't be around in our jobs. Somebody else will replace the person. So now, what I want to do is do an example, like we did on the other skills, ability, and knowledge. I want us to look at um, what skill or ability, or oh, sorry, what knowledge does somebody in the creative need to gain? What type of knowledge do they need to gain? Anybody? Let's say you're a singer. What kind of knowledge do you need to gain? The next trends. What, what's that? Let's say styles of music. Okay. Uh huh. What else? Yeah, techniques. All right, thank you. I think you're kind of moving ahead of us because of who you are. Um, what about makeup artists? What kind of, what kind of knowledge do you need to be gaining? Product knowledge of all kinds of products, right? The ones that is good for the body. Uh huh. What else? Do you know most people who, who are in the hairdressing business don't have no knowledge? You know, you go, to, you go to your hairdresser down the road, they can't tell you what's good for you. They can't tell you what's bad for you. They just do your hair. Some people will even tell you they can do hair that they're not capable of doing. Have you ever been to your hairdresser? Yeah, my wife went to one once. I won't tell you her nationality. She went to this person who claimed she could do a hairdo that she was not trained to do. My wife was close to tears when she came back. You know women and their hair, right? She was close, honestly, she was, she, I, I actually think 
I think she cried. Um, I think she cried, actually. She cried. Um, she wept. And, you know, she did. She did. Don't let her deceive me. She cried. After she cried, she had to go and pay someone else to fix the problem. Now, that, you know, when you lose one client, how many do you really lose? You lose all clients. People think you just lose one client. No, no, you don't. You could lose close to 100 or 200 other clients. With the money that goes with it. So we've got to be trained. We've got to know what we're doing. What about admin staff? What kind of knowledge do you need to gain as an admin staff? All kinds of software. Uh huh. Systems. You need to understand new systems. What are the new techniques of doing things? What about managerial job? If you're in a managerial job, what kind of knowledge do you need to gain? Sorry? Know about the industry. In industry knowledge. How many of us read industry magazines? <laughs> oh, you didn't hear my question. How many of us who are in employment read industry magazines? Let me ask the people on this side. <laughs> People on that side didn't hear me, so. You've not heard of it. In every industry that you're in, there are magazines for that industry. Whatever industry it is. Whether it's cooking, whether it's managerial jobs that you're in, or whatever industry, driving, cleaning, cleaning business, cleaning business. Yeah, they have industry magazine, right? They have an accreditation uh, uh, body, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she knows. Yeah, because she's she's gonna have the accreditation. She's gonna have the stamp on her. She's gonna have the stamp on her vans. She's gonna have a stamp on her vans that goes to clean. And when you have your mansion, you come and clean there too. Not her, her stuff. Can't have her to come and clean. <laughs> so now, what else do you need as a as a as a manager? What kind of what kind of knowledge do you need to 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 have? Communication skills, yeah. Actually, it's more important to have communication skills or people skills developed if you're in a managerial position. Your people skills will make the difference in your life. So, now let's go forward now. What's the way forward? Way forward is this. Write down the knowledge required for your job, then ask yourself the following questions. Here are the questions. Hopefully you will come up. Okay. What kind of knowledge will be required of you in five years' time? How long did the tabernacle last for? How long? The tabernacle that Bezalel built, how long did it last for? Sorry? Um, no. No, 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 no. Solomon built, Solomon built the, his temple 480 years after he came out. Yeah? And that lasted for another how many years? So over a thousand years, the tabernacle that Bezalel built lasted over a thousand years. It didn't go out of date. The knowledge God gave Bezalel to build that tabernacle lasted over a thousand years at least. So the knowledge you need to have is going to last many, many years. 
After a while, you need to update your knowledge. So it can last a few more years. Many of us say things like, oh, some of us don't even have an email. There was someone in this church who doesn't have an email. How can you exist today without an email? Doesn't matter what you do, you need to have an email. And we said to the person, come, let's sit down with you and do your email with you. And the person says, no, I haven't got time. You, you're like, well, what future are you going to have? Even Janine has an email. Joel has an email. He even emailed me once. Anyway. What's going to be required of you in five years' time? What kind of knowledge are you going to need? Whatever profession you are, you are in, in five years' time, things are going to change. Trust me. And sometimes, if you don't have the right knowledge, you're a bad witness for Christ. If you're incompetent at work, you cannot witness to somebody. They're going to laugh in your face. If your God is so good, how come you don't know what you're doing? Daniel knew what he was doing, right? Right? Remember, they tried to get Daniel at work. They couldn't get him at work. Because he was so proficient in what he did. They knew, okay, the only way we're going to get Daniel, we can't get him at work. He's not going to make a mistake. He's too good at what he does. Remember that bit in the Bible? Is there? He said, okay, we'll get him because we know he's going to have to pray. So that's how we're going to get him. But many of us, they can get you with your incompetence at work. If you had an inspection tomorrow, you'd be afraid. You'd be praying all night. And hoping that they don't find something. You don't have to live like that. So what training do you need? Where am I going to get that training? Stop waiting for your workplace to signpost you to a training. Stop it. You need to be thinking ahead what you're going to do. Ask yourself what training do I need to get so that I can go and get it? Part of your wages should be spent on training. Tell your neighbor, part of your wages should be, to be spent on training yourself. Tell your neighbor, buy training courses. Tell your neighbor, buy training courses online. And improve yourself so that you can be a better witness and you can get to a high position where you can have impact, influence, and high income for Christ's sake. Where you're really going is to be an expert in what you do. Bracken is now. Uh, Level 4 referee. FA approved level 4 referee. Put that together for him. So now, so now, my, my, my dream is now coming closer and closer every day. So when I watch Liverpool, when I watch Liverpool and uh, who was playing Liverpool and who? And Crystal Palace were playing a match the other day. Yeah, I'm like... And I looked at the box, I look at the VIPs there, said, already I'm there, right? Okay, you are laughing. Okay, laugh. Are you right? Honestly, so now he goes from level four to level three to level two A, level two B, and then level one. And then, you know, it would not be the best referee in, in the UK. Then he would go across the world to referee the World Cup. 
and stuff like that. It will have books on refereeing, adverts on refereeing. It might even be the first person that's gonna they're gonna do adverts with as a referee because we don't really see that, and I don't know why not. So we've talked about it. Why don't you be do want do some advert? Let them do an advert with you. And I'm with the pain advert just to sit down there and kick a ball around. Pay you a million pounds. Don't go and now be his friend because of what I said. I'm just joking, be his friend. What I'm saying is really, you're going to be thinking about yourself as coming to an expert position in what you do. Whatever it is. I sent a guy the other day, he wanted to do work in the youth, youth, uh, wanted to work with uh, troubled youth. They're called something else. Youth who are really troubled. They're called teens, is it? And they're, not in, they're not in this, they're not in that, they're not in education, they're not in... Uh, neat, 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 right? Really difficult children, he wanted to work with those. So we're talking, I said to him, I said, listen, he's going to do a degree in something, in youth work something. So I said to him, listen, you know when you finish your degree or in between, write a book. Then you be the expert. It's not about having a book. That people look at you a little bit more differently in that field. Whatever field you're in, if you're in care work, write a book. How to care for the elderly. Honestly, write a book. People look at you differently. They think you know everything because you have a book. Start positioning yourself as an expert. Experts earn more money than non-experts do. Am I correct? Whatever you want to do, start thinking of yourself as an expert. When are you going to become an expert in what you do? You gain skills, ability, and knowledge. Knowledge will get you there to be an expert. When you are an expert, and you tell people under you, come to my church. Guess what they'll do? All the argument is going to die. They can't be telling you, I'm not coming. Nobody should ever be able to bold enough to tell you I'm not coming. They can lie and say I'll come tomorrow and not come. Yeah? But they shouldn't be able to tell you to your face, I'm not coming. When I was lecturing and I tell my unbeliever students, come to my church, they will never tell me I'm not coming. I say, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> they may not come, but yeah, okay. You can't tell me you're not coming. Why is that? Use your influence for Christ's sake. So now, let's go on here. Any questions about this before I move on? How many of us fully comprehend what I'm talking about here? Yeah? Honestly, we need to get to this point where we become the expert. Any questions, please? I'm, I'm going to go on to something else. All right. I'm gonna, I want to share with us three principles. I want to share one with us today, and then we'll go on to the rest. To, to, to the others another day. This is now, remember where we came from. Before you write down, remember where we came from. We said there are six ways of using your gifts and abilities, right? What were they? You didn't help me out. What were the six things? Number one is what? Em employee, as an employee, thank you. Number two? Self-employment, number three? Alexander? Inventor is number six. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Business owner? Uh huh. What else? Fully automated. What about you, Kosi? An investor. Thank you. I think you don't know. They know. <laughs> I think they don't know. I said, what, what does she have to say? She's got a lot to say. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, she knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So now. You got employee, employer, sorry, employee, self-employed, business owner, 
fully, aut fully automated business, an investor, and an inventor. All right, now. So what we've done so far in the past three or four weeks was to look at how to now progress as an employee. So now you have all the tools within your arsenal that you need to progress forward as an employee. You should remain employable based on what we've been teaching now. If you apply everything we've been talking about, you shouldn't be out of work. In fact, work should be looking for you. It might take time to apply them, but really, when you put them to work, work will be looking for you. All right, now. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude the employee bit by giving you these three principles. So, the three principles are the 80-20 rule or the 75-25 rule. I'll explain them to you in a moment. What I call the best daily routine or best daily sandwich. I'm going to give you three of them, okay? Then I'm also going to now give you the three most important qualities required for you to continue your success as an employee. Really, really, really important. So write that down. I'm going to now go into a little bit more. The 80-20 or the 75-25 rule. What do you think I'm talking about there? The, the 75-25 rule, what's that? Productivity. What's 80-20 rule? All right. Okay. Thank you. You've done well. Turn your Bibles with me to to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Let me let me ground this first in Scripture, and then hopefully I'm going to be able to give you um, I'm going to be able to give you Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus is talking about no, Jesus, you know, I'm not going to mention names. You sit with some people and you you say you're going to teach them. But then, because they're full of the Spirit, they end up teaching you something. Does that ever happen to you? You sit with a spiritual person, you start teaching them something, and you think, yeah, I'm going to teach you something today. And the moment it all begins, they start teaching you something. That happened to me yesterday. And this thing came out of that meeting that we had. In Matthew 13, Jesus spoke about quite a few parables. And he began it all with a parable of the sower. And in that parable of the sower, uh, let, me just, let me just read. I won't be able to read everything, but I'll just read some. Actually, what happened was... Jesus spoke about the parable of the sower, and as he spoke about it, his disciples then asked him a question. And because they, they dared to ask him a question, he gave them seven different parables to explain that one parable. When disciples ask questions, it prompts long answers. So now, here's one of those. So we look at it from verse 18. It says, and I'll read, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown on the sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places. Is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since he has no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. 
The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Now, if you notice in that in that in that in that parable, the sower goes out to sow. And the seeds fell on four different kinds of, of soil. What were they? The pathway. Go ahead. That's the pathway. The last one is what? A good son. Thank you. All right. Notice here, even though the sower sold maybe a hundred seeds, 25 of them fell, some, on the pathway. 25 fell on the rock. 25 fell among the weeds or on the thorns. 25 then fell on the good soil that produced. 75% of the seeds did not produce anything. Am I correct? Only 25 produced something. Am I correct? Is that right? Can, can we make that assumption? Right? Okay, now. So, we're not going to have a look at it. We're going to have a look at what happened. Actually, there's one principle called the Pareto principle, which is the 80 20 rule. But Jesus gave us this principle here, which is the 75-25 rule. So I like Jesus' principle better. All right? I've, I've taught Pareto before. Now I'm going to teach Jesus' one. I like that. I'm more comfortable with that. <laughs> Sometimes I write books and I slip in scriptures inside. I was writing something there. I'm writing a new book now. And I said, you know, I, I, what did I say? I said, um, uh, because of your love for what you do, it will cast away every fear you have. Put it in there. <laughs> if I said the Bible says perfect law cast out all fear, you throw away the book. I said, oh, because of the love you have for what you do, it will cast away every fear that you have. I said, yeah, that's true. Yeah, just give me the word. All right, so now. The 75 25 rule. So Jesus says 75% of the seed sown just didn't work. Didn't produce anything. All right? Well, 25% of them produced something. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Actually, when you read commentaries about this, what really happened was the ones that produced produced almost th thousands of returns. So it really overshadowed the other three that didn't produce. Because it says 104, 34. It really, it, it just, it just. One commentary said, you, you sow 100 seeds, you, these people here produced 500,000. So it just really outshone the ones that did not produce, okay? Do you understand it so far? I'm going to go on a little bit more, okay. Jesus now began to explain. He explained that. First thing, notice about this parable, what it was the same farmer who sowed on the on the, the good seed on the pathway, some fell on the pathway. He didn't go to sow on the pathway, but I would say some fell on the pathway. So the lack of production was not the farmer's fault. He goes to sow. Bible says some fell on the on the pathway, and also those pathway, the rock, the weeds, the types of people. 
So when the farmer goes to sow, some of his seeds that he goes to sow fell on somebody who is a pathway type of person. It's not the farmer's fault. Next thing that happened is the same seed that was sown. The seed that produced a hundred folds is the same seed that was choked. It's the same seed that fell on the pathway. It's the same seed that fell on the rocky soil. Same seed. Again we see the problem is not the seed. It's the type of person. So, question is, who is the pathway kind of person? Comfortable with not understanding. They don't mind going home with not understanding anything. They read the Bible, they don't understand it, they don't, they don't mind, that's okay. That's a pathway person. Somebody who isn't reads the word, don't understand it, they start making phone calls. They start bothering some people. Oh, okay, come on, I just read. I don't get it. Come on. What am I missing here? They're comfortable with not knowing. Pathway person is okay if they don't know. Right. Same thing. Next thing. The farmer had. How do I know that? My question is, how did he know? How did the farmer know that some seeds fell on the pathway? He goes to check for his seeds. He expects this. He goes to check the rocky soil. He goes to check where it's choked by weeds. He goes to check it. He finds that it's choked. He finds that it's not going to produce anything. But still, he has an expectation in his heart for the seed he went to sow. This is going to make sense for you in a moment. Next thing, all of them had the same ability. They could all have produced if they made the right choice. When the, when the people don't produce, it's not the farmer's fault, it's not the seed's fault, it's not all that stuff. The person just produce. It's their choice. Now, only 25% produced actually when the people who produced a hundredfold was only 8%. Another 8% of their about 8.33 produced 60-fold. Another 8.33 produced 30-fold. Making it 25%. But those who were fully productive were 8%. Out of 100 people in the church, only 8% are fully productive. Is that good? That's bad. Well, Jesus said that. <laughs> he said, I know. I know that most of you are not going to produce anything. You know, I'm going to ask you a question first. If Jesus were to come today and he looked at your life, would he find you in the 25%? Is the person that says, yeah. Or would he find you in the choked by work? Because <laughs> they were, I'm too tired to read my Bible because when I come up from work, you see, Pastor, I come up from work, Pastor, I'm just really tired. Tell that to Jesus. To me, he understands, right? He's looking for you to produce. What does Jesus do to the people who don't produce? What does he do? You know what's scary? He cuts them off. Do I know that? John 15 tells me that. John 15 tells me if you don't produce, he cuts you off. 
You don't have time for you. <laughs> that's scary. That, that's how Jesus does it. Now, notice something else now. Jesus had in his ministry the five thousands or the, or the thousands. Am I correct? I want to break this down for you now. He had in his ministry the five thousands, right? Next group he had was what? Next group was what? He had five thousand disciples, then he had what? 120. Right? Then he had what? The 70. Then he had what? Oh, no. Somebody told me. No. Okay, he had the 12. Thank you. He had the 12. Then he had what? Ah, that's why I said. Somebody corrected me yesterday. I said, no, Pastor. He had the 11. I said, wow. You had learned something today. You're right. He had the 11. He had the 12. He had the 11, then he had what? The 3. Now guess what? When the going got tough, who left first? The 5,000, they walked away. When the going gets tough in the church, the people who are on the fringes, they're going to walk away. So Jesus spends time with who? Most of, okay, let me ask you this. Most of the time that Jesus spent on earth, spent with who? The twelve! The devil wants us to believe he spent it with these five thousand. That's a lie! He didn't! Yeah, he'll go and heal them sometimes. He'll go and feed them sometimes. He'll go say hello sometimes. He will the city sometimes. He'll do that. But it's quality time. He spent it here. The 12. The 11. Okay. Now that I've grounded this in the, in the spiritual context, so you understand clearly, I'm not going to take it to the employee context now. All right? Because now you understand that. If I, if I carry it on, I will just stay in the spiritual only. I, I won't do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit more. Let me now share this with you. Here's the deal. Okay, now, who were the most productive for Jesus? Come on, say it. Peter, uh huh. Peter, James, and John. Peter, uh, James was what? Which James are we talking about here, by the way? James, the brother of John. Zebedee. The Zebedees. James Zebedee. Sons of Thunder. What happened to him in the end? James, what happened to James in the end? He was beheaded by Herod. Why? He was so fervent for God, basically. And he said, I, I, I'm going. Their mom went to Jesus and said to Jesus, Okay, we want one to sit on your right side, one on your left and get to the kingdom. What did he say? He said, Those seats are reserved for those who have been reserved by, by God. He said, I can't decide who sits there or not. But he said to them, Well, can you can you suffer the same baptism as I'm gonna suffer? What did they say? He said, Yeah, we'll suffer the same thing. They didn't mind, they didn't mind dying for Christ. So I said, Jesus now said, What? Well, indeed you will. So Jesus was crucified on the cross. James also was beheaded. He suffered. What about John? How did he suffer? He was exactly out on the Patmos. Nothing grows there. So James, Peter, Peter James, and John were the most productive people for Jesus. Pretty much a lot of his time was spent with those. And he discipled them well. Now guess what happens here now? I'm going to show you this. 
25% of products yields 75% of the income. How many of us work in retail? Or oh, you've worked in retail before? Am I correct about that? Huh? 25% of products yield 75% of income. All right? This is the principle of Jesus now, right? Okay? Now, 25% of your actions will produce 75% of your income. Whether in the workplace or in business, actually, we'll talk about this as we go along. My sister that owns the cleaning company, 25% of your actions will produce 75% of your income. There's some things you do, and you need to identify what they are, that, will, that produces a lot for you. And there's some things you do, it doesn't produce anything. There are some things a husband does for the wife that produces some of the joy the wife has. So only 25% things, not 100% not things. Twenty-five percent of contact at work are the valuable contacts. Seventy-five percent of your contact at work, it's a waste of time. Look at the way you spend your time. Seventy-five percent of what you do with your time does not bring in any result at all. It's a waste of time. Just think about it. Now, here's the deal. What you and I need to do is to, first of all, identify what I call key values. In every workplace, there are some key values. Every workplace. Whatever the job is. When I was working at uh, PBC, the key number one value is you fulfill contracts. Boss don't care what you do, you must fulfill contracts. You don't fulfill contracts, really, you're a waste of space. So some people do everything else but fulfill contracts. You're going to be thinking to yourself, what are the key values? Let me ask you, let me say this to you, let me, let me explain this to you another way like this, right? In your workplace, okay, let me ask you this, let me ask you like this. How many of us can tell me, how many of us are employees? You're an employee, right? You work somewhere, right? Okay, thank you. What are the three top things the manager values the most about your job? Timekeeping, timekeeping, punctuality, timekeeping, and flexibility. So let's take those two anyway. Timekeeping and flexibility. Let me, let, let me say something to you. What happens if there was an employee who is very good on the tills? All right? But comes late every day. But when it comes to the tills, oh my God, nobody can rival him or her. They just pa pa pa. They can be talking and laughing while they're on the till. They're just like that. Oof, oof, oof. They're very good. But some, some people are very slow. We know that, right? They have to look. Uh, 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 uh. They have to say, okay, hurry up. You know. But this person is really good on the tills, but comes late to work. And it's completely inflexible. You say to them, stack the shelves, please. They go, uh, no, that's not really my job. You say, clean the floor. So, uh, oh, okay. It's just inflexible. But the manager values those two things as the top. So let's say there are 10 things the person does at work. 
but fails in those two. As far as the manager is concerned, they're a useless employee. What you need to do is to ask yourself, what are the key values at work? And make sure you do them very well. If you want to remain employable, follow the model that Jesus is suggesting to us. He says, there's 25% of the 5% rule. Learn to be productive. Jesus says, the 25% rule is this. You think about, you know, the guys who produced fruit, what did they do? They had what? What kind of heart do they have? They had a fertile lion heart. Why? Their heart was not like the pathway. Right? Their heart was not like the stony ground. They move all the stones. Their heart was not full of thorns. That's it. You do those three things, you'll go on. Jesus says the key values are those. What are the key values in your workplace? How many of us are in care work? What are the key values in the care work? Come on, give me three. Give me two. I'll take two. Communication with who? With your client. Huh? And patience. So somebody is rash. They don't talk to the client, but they want to remain in that job. That's going to happen. Because you missed out, you missed out on the two. Most important. You're going to learn what your two, two, or two or three values are and get better at it. Next thing, you've got to focus on those 25% things and improve as you go along. Are we getting something here? The 2575 rule says 25% of what you do produces 75% of your returns. And if you want to remain a good employee, you focus on the 25% and then you do it well. If you do that, you remain employable. If you don't do that, you won't remain employable. But I pray that you remain employable because you're wise. Jesus says, the secret of the kingdom has been revealed to you. You have a secret there. Let me tell you something. The Pareto principle is taught in all universities. It's, how many of us know that? It's, taught, it's, it's like it's huge. How do you spend your time? So it depends on what you do. It's a waste of time. It's not important. But 25% of your time is so important that if you use it well, you make up for everything else. Most of your friends are useless. They're not useful to you. If you gather a lot of friends, you're wasting your time. Only 25% of them out of 100 are useful. The rest are useless. It sounds rough, but it's a fact. So the question is, who do you spend most of your time with? The 75% that are useless or 25% that are useful to you? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for great grace. We thank you for helping us to understand these things that we're talking about today. That we may remain employable. That we may be a good witness. That we may be good disciples and leaders in our workplaces. Because we know that as we become leaders and people of impact and influence and high income, we become better witnesses for you. We want to be like Erastus. We want to be like Lydia. We want to be like David, Abraham, Job, Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach. We want to be like Paul. 
We want to be men and women that our generation long to talk to because we're experts in our field and the things we do. And we can lift up the banner of Christ because people come to us and as a result of our position, we use it to get people saved. Lord, help us to be better in what we do. Let your name be glorified. Let your name bring, let us be the people that bring beauty to your name because of how we work. Help us, oh God. Thank you, Father, because what we have learned to put into practice. We shall remain employable. In fact, jobs will look for us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.